This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. By 1967, Billy Sunday Burt had gone from a heavy equipment operator at the Gainesville Stone and Rock Quarry and making whiskey on the side for extra money to full-blown criminal. He was quickly building an empire and diving deeper and deeper into the underworld of robbery, illegal gambling, and hauling and selling hundreds of thousands of gallons of bootlegged whiskey all over the South. The man who was once so poor he had to steal food to survive had now entered a whole new world, one of wealth and power. He was now mixed in with a crowd of high-profile kingpins like A.D. Allen, who specialized in bootlegging, stolen cars, and chop shops. He was also known for dealing in stolen high-end clothing. A.D. Allen was reportedly head of a $1 million operation based out of Commerce, Georgia about 20 miles northeast of Winder. In today's money, that's over seven and a half million dollars. Not bad for a country boy, right? A.D. got away with all kind of stuff, and I would imagine he would be one that would have gone to Billy Burt and said, I've got to get rid of this. This guy's going to testify against me in trial. You know, I don't know. I don't have any uh, evidence that, that that ever happened. But uh, I do know there were people who disappeared before they could uh, be called on to testify. Another whiskey kingpin named Cliff Park had made a name for himself in the Tri-County area of Barrow, Banks, and Jackson. Cliff Park, his kingpin operation consisted of two things. Loan sharking. He would loan money for 20%. That 20% didn't go for a year or two. That 20%, if you told the man you're going to pay him back in two weeks or a month, it was 20%. Compound interest on a credit card is a joke compared to the VIG on interest from a loan shark. Well, he was that. His other claim to fame as a kingpin, he would buy whiskey and beer from other states like Carolina, where it was a lot cheaper, so was cigarettes. He would bring them here and he would sell them without paying Georgia taxes. He sold to uh, teenagers. He sold to anybody. I mean, he wasn't, uh, I mean, he, he didn't care. I mean, he just sold to anybody that wanted to come buy it. And, and that's according to friends in high school who said they, they could get it. In 1967, Cliff Park was 76 years old. He was thin and frail looking with grayish white hair and wore thick horn rimmed glasses and was well dressed. Honestly, He looked like a typical grandfather. But underneath that unassuming exterior was something much more sinister. A kingpin has his own world. And for Cliff Parks, it was Jackson County. In that county, he was all powerful. He owned the sheriff. He owned the DA. He owned everybody. When I say owned, they were on his payroll one form or another. And if they want to take him down, they'd have to go down with him. That is what a kingpin does. He gets everybody into the tangle of his web. From Imperative Entertainment, this is In the Red Clay. Cliff Park's racketeering, loan sharking, and bootlegging business had made him rich. And as always, along with money comes power. He bribed sheriffs and DAs for information about when raids were going to take place at one of his many operations, so that he had time to clear out the area of anything illegal. When police arrived, they would find nothing but a seemingly legitimate business or an empty warehouse. But he was on the radar of Floyd Horde, a newly elected solicitor general, or district attorney as it would later become known, of the Piedmont Judicial Circuit, serving Banks, Barrow, and Jackson counties. Horde's son, author G. Richard Horde, remembers how bad things had now become in their once Mayberry-esque little town. Well, just the just the underworld element there, and how powerful they were, or how powerful they felt they were, what they uh, thought they were able to get away with back uh, then. They seemed to think they were beyond the uh, the law uh, in a lot of ways. 
it was big business. It wasn't just like moonshine on the, you know, getting you a little uh, nip <laughs> out on the weekends. This was a, a big business, uh, tens of thousands of dollars that, uh, you know, come across uh, into some hands in a night. In 1965, Jimmy Carter had implemented Operation Dry Up, a campaign alerting the public to the dangers of moonshine and how it negatively affected the economy. It was a big thing. It was all in the papers and it was called Operation Dry Up. And um, yeah, it had all the people up here to work. He also sent 165 federal agents into the South to combat the bootlegging and subsequent crime wave. The agents, called revenuers, made public displays of their efforts by smashing stills and pouring moonshine into sewer drains for all to see. They wanted bootleggers to know that they were after them and that they were succeeding. 83-year-old Gordon Perkle is a moonshine historian from Dawsonville, Georgia, which is known as the moonshine capital of the world. And being a former bootlegger himself, arrested 34 times for making and running whiskey, he knows what he's talking about. The feds really got uh, cracking down on it. All the towns below here uh, were stopping any car that looked like it might be having liquor on it. It, it really slowed it down some. Uh, uh, it had to, you know. But after nearly two years, Operation Dry Up still hadn't made as much progress as they had hoped. In fact, it seemed they hadn't made a dent in the booming business. Because as soon as they busted up one liquor still, two more popped up in part because much of the police force at the time were being either paid off or were customers themselves. The police witness, uh, the sheriff or whatever, they, they just knew if you started catching liquor people, you ain't going to get elected again in this county. So they kind of protected them, and most of them had part of their family was in it too. Or they simply did not have enough of a police force to actually pursue all of the people making liquor way out in the mountains. In fact, the police force in Barrow County, where Winder is located, was so small, they had less than 10 employees at the time. And this included the radio operator, who wasn't out in the field. When you take into account different work shifts and days off, this means you might have only one officer working the night shift, when most of this activity was likely to take place. It wasn't altogether organized, as made clear by the way former Barrow County Sheriff Joel Robinson became a deputy. And although this particular instance took place in 1974, it gives you a good idea of how things worked back then. Uh, I come in to work one day and I was a radio operator for the sheriff. And... uh, I started up the steps and he won't know where I was going. And I said, I'm going to work. And he said, you're not working in there anymore. Uh, you're a deputy. And I said, I don't know anything about a deputy. I ain't never arrested nobody. And he said, well, you're a deputy right now. He said, get in that car and go patrol. And I said, I don't have to do nothing. I don't know how. And he said, well, you get out and you see somebody doing something wrong, you call me and I'll tell you what to do. The bootlegging and crime wave had become a cancer on the small towns. But Floyd Horde was going to change all of that, one way or another. I guess, uh, to me, the thing that I was proudest of him it was his ability to hit the softball and throw you know he was such an athlete floyd horde's son richard is a retired pastor and teacher living in athens georgia he's written several books including one about his father's life and legacy called alone among the living he'd been in the philadelphia philly organization up until the time when i was born and he came to jackson county in 1952 uh, right about the time of my birth and about the time that my um, grandfather had his first stroke and was unable to continue really handling the day-to-day business of his law firm. 
The World War II veteran quit his job as a school teacher and baseball coach and moved the family to Jefferson, Georgia, to live with his wife's parents to help on the farm. His father-in-law, a lawyer and the mayor of the town of Jefferson, urged Hoard to start studying law as well. My father takes the LaSalle extension course for law. He was the last person who took that particular course and then passed the bar. After that, you had to go to law school. He did not go to law school. He ended up taking this extension course, but he, but the big thing, you know, yeah, he was allowed to take the bar exam, passed it, and that's when he began his law career in Jefferson. In 1964, 37-year-old Floyd Horde was elected to the position of Solicitor General and was responsible for arguing cases before the Supreme Court, providing legal advice to the county, as well as bringing indictments to the judge against criminals. He was tall, with narrow eyes and dark hair that was combed straight back from his high hairline. He ran under the ticket that we're going to clean up what is going on in the county here. When he, when he stepped into it, I think the first week he made an arrest, they started into it immediately, trying to uh, put a stop to some of the, the stuff that was going on in uh, uh, the district. Ford immediately started going to work and targeting the big players in the game. He filed 79 indictments in just a short time in office. So many that a second judge was hired to handle the caseload. I mean, I, I don't know that he had any idea how bad it was. Just uh, when he jumped in, there were, you'd had a sheriff who'd been convicted on car theft charges back the year before he was elected. You had, uh, you know, Mr. Park, for example, had been in federal prison for selling moonshine, and that's the one that ends up being the uh, kingpin. And, and so all of this go, had been going on for a while. I don't know just how, I guess, how much of a network that uh, he knew was going on. I mean, you know that this is happening, but maybe you think it's just individuals that are doing something, not a not a network. You know, I think a big thing in a way is you, when your sheriff is, uh, you know, accused of car theft and actually serves time for it, it suggests that uh, there were payoffs uh, that were going on. The sheriff Richard is referring to is John B. Brooks, who served as Jackson County Sheriff for 21 years after being arrested for car theft. He also dabbled in bootlegging and was tied to Cliff Park. You now have an inexperienced, understaffed police force, some of which are customers of the very people they're supposed to be putting in jail, and some are on the payroll of those same people. You have a sheriff who is a convicted car thief You have a criminal network that is expanding and becoming more powerful with each passing day. And then you have Floyd Horde, the baseball playing school teacher turned lawman who's now smack in the middle of it all. He had become the face of opposition to these kingpins. He was on their radar as much as they were on his. Horde needed help. You know, you have a have a world like that. You would like to trust some of your officials, but who can you trust, really? Who can you trust? And who could Horde trust? Certainly not the local police force. And he was now a target of the organized crime ring in the area. He had even been warned to put a piece of clear scotch tape on the hood of his car. That way he could tell if someone had tampered under the hood. And he started carrying a gun with him everywhere he went something that was out of character for Horde. You're not a law man. Why, you know, why are you carrying a gun? You know, you don't think, you don't think much about it like he could end up, he's going to have to use it. Governor Carl Sanders had recently signed an executive order giving the GBI original jurisdiction in Jackson County due to the amount of local police corruption. This meant that the GBI had unrestricted access to the county and could bypass the local law enforcement if they deemed it necessary. Ford soon turned to Ron Angel, 
a friend who had recently become an agent with the GBI. The two devised a plan to take down Cliff Park, who had by this time become the top dog. I don't know if he uh, felt like he would have the kind of support or the help. I mean, he obviously didn't from the local people, and that's why he went to the GBI, you know. But, you know, maybe he's thinking they would have enough uh, ability to, to help and protect. The men decided to hit Park where it hurt the most, his bootlegging operation. Ron Angel would go undercover and purchase enough alcohol from Cliff Park to have evidence for a raid. Richard remembers when Angel came to his house one day to borrow some of his clothes so that he would look inconspicuous and blend in with the non-professional crowd. Angel went on to make 14 undercover purchases in a one-week span, collecting evidence. They now had what they needed to get a search and seizure warrant for Park's operation. And with the help of the GBI, they planned the raid. This time, they decided to leave the local law enforcement out of the loop because they knew they couldn't be trusted. They even went to a different judge to get a warrant because they had no way of knowing how far up the chain Cliff Park could reach. When my father and uh, some of the GBI folks raided Mr. Park's place, we'd kind of figured out that the what was more than $20,000 of inventory back then. Needless to say, this enraged Cliff Park. He would not let this act go unpunished. Floyd Horde would pay. Park paid a $4,500 bond and set out to have Horde killed almost immediately. He sent Junebug Stinchcomb to find someone to carry out the hit. And Junebug knew exactly who to call. He called my father. He said, Billy, Cliff Parks is offering $20,000 for someone to take out Floyd Horde. He wants to know if you'll do it. Park wanted to use dynamite. I assume to send a message. That is, don't fuck with me again. My father told him, Hell no. Tell him be the dumbest damn thing he ever done. Tell him to think about this. What files has this man got? And when something happened to him like that, who in the hell are they going to come after him? Tell him the best thing, thing he can do is just back off or go to another county, but do not fuck with that DA. When Bert refused, Junebug asked him if he would at least sell him the dynamite. He could easily get it by robbing stone quarries like the one he used to work at. He said, hell no, I won't sell him a dynamite, I won't sell him a gun, I don't want no part of it. It's a fool's game. And Junebug left. But Park wouldn't back down that easily. Within a few weeks, two young thugs had agreed to do the job and purchase dynamite through an unknown source, telling them that it was for a well-digging job. On August 7th, Ford was due to attend a grand jury meeting to discuss the indictment of Cliff Park and several other kingpins, with evidence of numerous bootlegging, theft, and racketeering charges the following Monday morning. It would have been enough to put a lot of people behind bars. But on that Friday morning, Floyd Hoard would kiss his wife goodbye. He spoke his final words to her. Don't ever forget how much I love you. And walked out the front door. What you're about to hear is graphic and disturbing. Well, I was in the back of the house. I was, uh, I'd uh, had the light on during the night. I'd been reading and, uh, I was kind of a spooky kid anyway. I read too much, uh, too much horror stuff. And so I'd kind of read back in the back, gone to sleep. I, you know, if you go to sleep holding a book, they, they don't think about you. Uh, you're scared to turn the light out. But I felt somebody came and turn out the light that was right at my bed. It wasn't very long after that, you know, maybe five, ten minutes, that I was awakened by the explosion in the front of the house. 
And I, you know, I, it was confusing. I didn't know what it was. You hear this. I actually, you know, looking back, believe I heard the first click of the dynamite uh, cap, you know, the blasting cap. I heard this click, and then suddenly this, you know, loud explosion that is like an artillery round. Uh, it shook the house, and I was confused, and I, uh, Walked out. I, I was in the very back of the house. It's an old country house, so I had a door that I walked outside, walked around the house. And as I, I got to the front, I, the first thing, my mother is coming with a bucket, trying to, uh, there's a tap right uh, at the corner of the front yard. And she's, you know, trying to put water in there, I think. She's just kind of running in circles and saying, you know, we got to get the, the fire out. I think your daddy's just been killed. You know, I mean, I just, I just think that don't, why would you jump to things like that? Daddy's probably in town. And then I turn the corner and there's the car. And you, you see, this is, uh, this is, just really, how, how's anybody going to live out of that, you know? He was just uh, really torn up in that. As you could see, his intestines, he'd been impaled. We'd thrown him in the back seat. The steering wheel was uh, sort of impaling him, it looked like, to the seat. And his face was lacerated, his jaw was broken. It had shredded uh, his pants, you know, and you could see the bones of his leg. You know, and you're, and you're 14 years old, and you go uh, get the, you go get that water bucket, and you try to fill it up, and you douse the flames, you're trying to put, put the fire in the engine out. And my sister comes out. She's trying to give mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, you know. Uh, and she's saying it's not doing any good. All his teeth are gone. So she tells me to do mouth-to-nose. Hord's teeth had been blown out and were lodged in his throat, preventing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. 14-year-old Richard and his sister Peggy Jean desperately tried to save their father's life as their mother ran into the house to call for help. And, uh, you know, while we're, while we're sitting there, I mean, I think he breathed his last. He had this long guttural groan, and then he, that was it. You know, she said, breathe in there. So I did. I, I did what I had to do, it seemed like forever. I was sitting there breathing and I knew how to do it, you know, from PE class. And cover, you know, you can't get air in the mouth. You you put your hand over the mouth and breathe into the nose. And then, you know, you're trying to, and I remember his chest going up, you know, I breathe that much in it, and then it go back down and nothing wasn't doing anything. My uncle, who's chief of police, pulled up. Uh, I remember Horace Jackson and his uh, ambulance, which doubled his hearse back then. The funeral homes ran the ambulance service. Irony of ironies, you know. They they pulled up, and they uh, others were getting there just uh, immediately after people started coming in and. Before long, they cordoned off the yard. One person said, get him out of here, you know, talking about me. He has no business seeing this. And I thought, I've seen too much already. You know, I mean, what are you protecting me from? They came, and I remember some of them, I, I thought, what in the world are they going to find in all this? It just looks like a tremendous mess. The men had placed dynamite on the front left strut support of Horde's green Ford Galaxy and wired the blasting cap to an ignition coil. 10 to 12 sticks of dynamite, not one stick, 10 to 12 sticks. When he started the engine, the dynamite detonated. Now, 
The twisted wreckage of the car lay smoldering and smoking in the front yard, with a crowd of dazed onlookers trying to make sense of what had happened. People coming out, it looked like they were holding tweezers and things, picking up things. And, and that was pro- all probably within an hour or so that, that folks were getting there and cordoning it off um, and doing that kind of work. My father was still still in the car. You can smell here is burnt. You can smell gasoline and burn. You just, you're just sort of sucker punched. I don't know how you can describe being so numbed, so shocked. You know, did this happen? Did I really see what I saw? Did this really happen? We never spent another night in that house. The murder of Floyd Horde sent shockwaves through the community. Is there any fear in this town as a result of what happened to Mr. Horde? Well, let me say this. Uh, certainly the uh, citizens of Jefferson and Jackson County and this area are, of course, uh, uh, were horrified to learn of this uh, terrible uh, uh, thing, uh, the murder of Mr. Horde. And that shockwave rattled the underworld, too. Every kingpin involved in organized crime in the area was angry that Cliff Park had made such a brazen move. Not because they cared about Floyd Horde, or any other lawman for that matter, but because they knew that this act would not come without consequences. This would, without doubt, bring heat on them like they'd never seen. Of that much, they were sure. This is a dastardly gang-type killing. It's regrettable. And this represents what could happen in a lot of areas unless law enforcement agencies in this state and state government, local governments, are given the opportunity and position to, to call a halt to some of the illegal operations taking place in this state. The hell that come to Georgia when Cliff Parts killed that Floyd Horde, the DA, it really pissed some people off. It stopped them dead in their tracks. They could make no money because hell was coming loose in Georgia because you do not kill a public official like that. Federal and state agents and officials were brought in from all over. The murder made national news and would not be ignored. Horde's death was even reported in Time and Newsweek magazines. Now, for the first time, the powers that be, the kingpins, had reason to work together. The big players in the game aside from Cliff Park, were Ruth Chancy, her brother-in-law, Bush Chancy, and her son, Harold, who had their bootlegging empire, Lee Gilstrap with his prescription drug and gun sales, Reese Spencer, who ran an illegal gambling joint out of his nightclub and dealt in the purchase and sale of stolen goods, and C.W. Royster and Junebug Stinchcomb, who were liaisons between these groups. Ruth, C.W., and Harold come to my father because at that time, for the first time ever, they had a reason to think about it. They realized that my father was the only man that walked in all these circles, welcoming all these circles, without fear because there was nothing to be feared of. He was each one of these people's go-to man. And these people did not interrelate. By this time, Billy Burt was doing contract jobs of all types for every major player in the game. It might be hauling a load of whiskey. It might be robbing high-end clothing from a textile warehouse or burning down a building so someone could collect the insurance money. For the past two years, Billy Burt had added contract killing to his resume, which is why Cliff Park approached him to murder Floyd Horde in the first place. When you are making whiskey and there comes a time to when somebody gets busted, hauling the load, somebody gets busted, and they 
make a deal with the authorities to turn sex evidence. And I say it on my father. Let's just say it. it's not on my father. It's on two of his associates. You, my father, or those associates have two choices. They can follow the law, get a good lawyer and try to beat it, and let the chips fall where they may, in which case they're probably going to prison for five years, leave their family. The only other choice was to take him out. The first time he had to do that was in 1965. Harold Chancey had one of his people busted on the run. And this guy was going to turn state's evidence. So he come to daddy about it. And they we're talking about it. He said, I don't know what they're going to do. I'm going to have to hire somebody to take care of him. And my father said, well, hell, I'll do it because if it gets your ass, it's going to get me too because the way it was structured and the way it was, if Harold went down, my father went down. He was he was connected anyway. That first one was $5,000. Harold paid him $5,000 to see this guy never made it to court. This guy to this day has never been found. Self-preservation would become Billy's number one priority. Ruth and Harold Chancey asked Billy if he would round up this group and set a meeting to discuss what was to be done. The meeting would be held on a Saturday morning at Reese Spencer's nightclub, the Night Owl Lounge. As was the norm at this point, young Stoney would tag along with his dad that morning. I sat in the car to be in the last 30 minutes. The five that showed up not counting Reese, he made six. They went in there, and this is directly to me, word for word, from Reese. He said that my daddy led the meeting. He said, it was kind of funny. Your daddy couldn't talk plain, and you could understand some of what he said, but you could damn sure understand his body language, baby. He called everybody baby, Reese did. Remember, Billy Burt had a severe speech impediment. He said, my dad said, look, what we're here for is it can't be no more public officials taken out unless ever who's going to do it give the rest of us time to pull our horns in and get ready for it. And anybody who don't want to agree to that, uh, he's on his own. It was only then that everybody knew that, number one, he was the common denominator, and number two, anybody that didn't agree to it and we're going to call in and say, okay, I'll fix it, do something stupid, and we'll let y'all know. That would give Ruth, Harold, and Sid every time to get hire my dad to take them out. That was unsaid. And there, after that 30-minute meeting, the Dixie Mafia was formed. It was decided that Billy Burt was the go-to man for anything they might need taken care of. He just was the effective leader of it. And he was humble about it. He didn't realize he was, but everybody else did. Even I, even I at age 10 knew he was, just by the way people treated him. But he never, never seemed to get it. He was just doing business as usual, being himself. Oh, a whole new level. Now, every one of them talked to him on a weekly basis to get him to do a job. And that's where the murder started potting up. In the Red Clay is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was created, written, and reported by me, Sean Kipe, and I wrote and created the original music score. Executive producers are Jason Hoke and Gino Falsetto. Story editor is Jason Hoke. Produced and engineered by Shane Freeman, Jason Hoke, and myself. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. Voice sessions recorded at Tree Sound Studios, Atlanta, Georgia. Archival footage licensed courtesy of Brown Media Archives, University of Georgia, and WSB-TV in Atlanta, Georgia. In the Red Clay is a 12-episode series with new episodes available every Tuesday. Follow us on Instagram at In the Red Clay Podcast. Have questions? Email us at podcasts at imperativeentertainment.com. If you like the show, tell your friends and leave us a review. Thanks for listening. <laughs>